Thank you. Thank you all. Sometimes I think when I hear all this stuff about me, of a symphony orchestra ready to come out, everybody's on his feet, applauding, applauding, and finally silence, and then a little mouse comes out. <laughs> I'm nobody, I just don't count. I mean that sincerely. But you know, I, what I can say, what, yes, I have to say yes, I've done all these things. But I can say also, and very sincerely, that the only reason that I've been able to do them is that I haven't done them. I remember I wanted, as a young man, to be a playwright and a poet. This was my mild ambition. But I wanted to share truth with people. And I woke up one morning to the realization that I didn't know truth. So why should I flood the world with my ignorance? I decided I wouldn't write anything more. And when I had been with Yogananda some years and he told me to write, I still didn't feel that I was ready. But in time, I have been able to. And the reason is, just like that piece of uh, music that you heard before, it's called uh, Life is the Quest for Joy. And I wanted a piece of music that would express all the human condition, the joy, the sorrow, the hopes, the ambition, the disappointment, the tragedy, everything. I thought, that's hopeless. It can't be. Then one day, I thought again, well, I can't do it, but maybe God can give it to it. And so I did what I've always done, but even more strangely. I put my fingers on the keyboard of the piano, and they said, God, give me a melody that says all that. And my hands began to move. And that melody came out. Da -da 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 -da. Da 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 and so on. It's a long one, I'm gonna bore you with it. But I must say that it said what I wanted. And uh if I am here tonight, it is not to represent Swami Kriyananda, he's as I said, nothing. But I have had the great privilege, honor, and joy of living for three and a half years with one of the great men on this planet. And it is my privilege and joy to be able to share these things with you. And in fact, in my book, The New Path, what I have tried to do is present my life with Master, as I call him, in such a way that people would be able to say, well, I could have been there too. I want to include people. I don't want to say I had that luck, poor slobs. <laughs> I wanted to be able to say, this is something we could all have. Sometimes people ask me, do I need a guru? I say, absolutely not. You don't need a guru. But when you reach the point where you desperately know, want to know God, then you do need a guru. And this was my search. And I hope it will be the search of many of you here, God willing, all of you. But when I was a young boy, you might say, 13 years old, I was born in Romania of American parents, so I don't really know what I am, neither fish nor fowl. <laughs> but I had this deep desire to know what truth is, to know why we are here on this planet. And I thought that if I can ever find this truth, I do want to share it with other people. I don't want to keep the whole cheese for myself. <laughs> and I began by trying to find truth through astro astronomy, because I'd always been inspired by, by the stars and the beautif beautiful expanses of space. And in fact, I remember somebody gave me a telescope, 18X, not very strong. And I looked at it, and I looked at the moon, and I was so thrilled to see all those trees on the moon <laughs> until I discovered it was just the dirt on the lens. <laughs> I didn't even have it focused, but still, my desire was to show, to understand how, how this vast universe came into being and why. And I was making a telescopic lens and it fell off after six months of patient grinding and broke on the floor and I, I sort of lost heart. So then I turned to politics and I thought, well, maybe through a good system, um, 
we'll find what we're looking for. And I tried with, uh, I, I didn't know anything about communism, but my idea of shared wealth and so on. And I realized that wasn't going to make anybody happy. And I tried it through music, and I tried it through art, and I tried it through all sorts of things. Business I didn't need to try, because my father had been uh, fairly high up in the Esso Corporation. I'd grown up with that, and I really didn't have any interest in that. I remember when I was 16, my father wanted to get me a tuxedo, and I said, Dad, don't bother. I'll never wear it. In fact, I'm never going to earn enough money to pay income tax. <laughs> well, it turned out to be true. <laughs> I met Yogananda not very long afterwards. I was 22 years old, and from then on, I've lived for God. But I didn't seek God, and you might wonder, well, why? How can you seek truth and not think about God? The fact is that I, every church I had been to just let me down. I asked of them a, a loaf and they gave me a stone. I was very bitterly disappointed with what the churches had given me. I didn't like churchianity. I didn't like the thought that if you belong to this organization, this church, go to these Sunday services, then you will find God, you will find salvation. And what was salvation? Struggling for eternity in that little body? My God, what a hell! <laughs> and I remember, I wanted, as I said, to be a playwright, and I remember I went down to Charleston, South Carolina. There was a, there was a, uh, a theater there, and I wanted to learn stagecraft. And one night, I went out for a walk into the evening, and I asked myself, everything that I've tried to seek an answer to, it always comes back to that question, God then surely there must be some understanding of God that I'm not getting in the churches. And I asked myself, what is God? And the next question came up, who am I? I must be a part of him or I wouldn't be asking that question. And then I thought, well, his consciousness, it, he must be conscious, he can't just be an abstract force. It isn't my brain only that makes me conscious. It must be something that I'm in tune with receiving. And I realized that God had to be infinite consciousness. And I found, as I meditated on it further, walking through the night, that when I was happier, when I was more clear-minded, when I felt more in tune with the universe, it was when I was more in tune with my higher self. And when I wasn't feeling those things, it was because I was less in tune. And I decided then and there, I was 21 years old, and I said, then I've got to seek God. That's the only purpose of life. There is no other reason we've been born, but I'll go on with that later on. I really decided from then on I would give my life to God. And I remember coming back to my apartment. I was sharing it with four other young men. And they sort of laughed at me because they saw me so serious. And what's the matter with old Don, they called me. And uh, I just thought, these are a bunch of yapping puppies. And I just left the room. I, I couldn't stand that, in that association. And I decided that I would become a hermit. Now, mind you, I had never heard of knowing God. I'd never known that anybody could know God. I'd never read books about saints. I'd never heard anything about Indian philosophy. I, all, all I knew was what the churches had taught me, which I absolutely rejected. And yet, I knew that this was what I had to do. And I began suddenly to think, am I going crazy? Has anybody in history ever thought this way? I must be going mad. And I remember trying to go upstate New York and trying to find what I was looking for in the peace of the country. <laughs> Well, my book tells all about that piece. But I, and I found a book on my mother's shelf. Somebody had written, had told me in Charleston about a book called the Bhagavad Gita. And I didn't know that book. I didn't know anything about that philosophy. But somehow that name, it had a resonance with me. And I, <clears throat> I found a book on my mother's 
the shelves when I came back to her. She was, we lived in Scarsdale, but she was living temporarily in White Plains. And uh, I, uh, first of all, I read her Bible. I didn't have a Bible of my own. And I'm afraid I bogged down in the begats. So-and-so begat so-and-so and lived to be so many hundred years, and he died. It, it, I just thought, well, if God really had wanted me to follow that way, surely he'd have got, introduced me in some better way to the Bible than that. Because I was just, it just didn't say anything to me. And then I saw another book on her shelves, and it said, A Short World Bible. And when I read the excerpts from the Hindu teachings, I was absolutely floored. First of all, here was something that was talking about God as infinite. Well, that deeply appealed to my, my uh, scientific side. God couldn't be just a man with a long white beard or a judge uh, uh, waiting to condemn people to hell. He couldn't be that. He must be something more. And this infinite. But then he also said, it also said, God is not, you can't limit him. There are millions of definitions of God. But you can't say he's this or that. He's everything. And then it said that no one person and no one religion can own God. And I thought, what a relief to hear that. <laughs> and my mother, my father had just been, this was the working of karma, the working of God's will, anything you want to call it. But my father had been sent to Egypt to uh, be in charge of an oil exploration there. And I was packing my mother up to go join him. And the day I put her on the ship, that day, I walked uptown New York and I found autobiography of, autobiography of a yogi. I tell you, it was, I, if my parents had been there, I who knew absolutely nothing about these teachings, I don't know if I'd have had the strength of will to tell them I'm going out to do this thing which they would have thought completely crazy. But they were powerless. They were, mother was on a ship, dad was over there, we didn't have airplane travel in those days. Well, there were some, but not, not enough for, for that. And uh, this was 1948. And I read this, I got this book and I read it between tears of joy and tears of love. It was the most moving experience of my life. I really took virtually the next bus across the country. I had never thought that I would ever do this. I was an ordinary, arrogant young man. I never dreamed that I would say this to him, but I went four days and four nights across the country by bus. I went to Yogananda. He had just finished lecturing in Hollywood Church. The first words I addressed to him were, I want to be your disciple. I have never regretted those words in these 61 years. It was the moving, the pivotal point of my life. And I have, when you're on to a good thing, I'd say hang on to it. <laughs> I knew I had found that, the, you know, I have to say this too, that here I had a normal Western education. And on page eight of Autobiography of a Yogi, I think it's page eight, Larry Marsha is materializing in a wheat field. <laughs> I tell you, there were many things I had to put on a shelf. But what convinced me about him was himself. I had never, in the pages of a book, encountered so much greatness, so much humility, so much love, so much compassion, and so much bliss. And I had been willing to give up everything and go and live in a jungle if I, just thinking I might somehow, with uh, time, effort, and luck, find a little peace of mind. And he, in his book, he talked about the joy of God. In fact, he showed us and taught the nature of God is Satyananda, ever existing, ever conscious, ever new bliss. 
Everything has come out of that bliss. Sometimes people say, well, why did God create the universe? Sri Yukteswar, my guru's guru, said that, that uh, we have to leave a few questions to be answered in the divine. But I think I have an answer to that. It's the nature of bliss to want to express itself. And the more I have of this bliss, which sometimes I can hardly stand, the more I feel I want to share. I'd love to just, if every, anybody wants to shoot me for doing it, who cares? I don't mind at all. <laughs> because there's only one thing in life. And the reason that I, I have found for loving everybody is not what that man told Yogananda in Autobiography of a Yogi, the leveling uh, unity of egoic principle that you have to take for granted but the fact that everybody in the world is seeking that bliss. That's the reason for loving everybody. It's, they may be mafiosi, they may be criminals, they may be drunks, they may be all kinds of people, but the reason they do what they do is that they want happiness and they don't know how to find it. And this was Yogananda's great manifesto before he came to America. He said, everybody in the world is trying to find two things. One, how to avoid pain and suffering. As it says in the Bhagavad Gita, Oh Arjuna, get away from this, from my ocean of suffering and misery. And people look around, they have good cars, they have houses, they have a job. What do you mean suffering and misery? But it's there. It's always waiting around the next corner. You can't get away from it because everything in this world is based on duality. For every up there has to be a down. When spirit created the universe, spirit was without any motion. And to create it, he had to create vibration. And vibration means movement in opposite directions. And so everything in this universe is based on that vibration. And in human life, what it means is that every success must be followed by a failure. Every fulfillment must be followed by a disappointment. Every pain that people find, that people endure, has to be followed by a joy. But it's always up and down. And the soul reaches the point where finally it says, I've had enough. I've worked all these lives, all these lives, trying to find a fulfillment, thinking I'll find it in this thing, you know, that person, this place, whatever it be, and I haven't found it yet. You know, the sum total of all human effort is and cannot but be zero. It's a leveling thought, isn't it? When you realize that it's all for nothing, <laughs> but it really is. I mean that literally. There's only one way out. And the beautiful thing is that in all of human society, you find people who become great in one way or another, great scientists, great singers, great musicians, great artists, great businessmen, whatever. Ask them, are you happy? Somebody asked Howard Hughes just a week before he died, are you happy? Nah, I can't say I'm happy. The richest man in the world, he wasn't happy. I've known wealthy people, rarely have I seen a happy one. I've seen poor people, and many times I have seen happy people, but there's no, that doesn't mean everybody should be poor, but what it does mean is that we shouldn't be attached to anything. We shouldn't feel that anything is ours. I have often recommended to people that they, every night, they sort of mentally build a bonfire and throw all their attachments into that bonfire. And one woman said, yes, well, I, I was attached to my house, so I kept throwing my house mentally into the bonfire, and it burned down. <laughs> I said, that isn't what I meant. <laughs> Don't throw your house into it. Throw your attachment to, into it. Well, anyway, when I met Yogananda, it was... As people have said, how did you feel then? I tell you, I felt so desperate, I didn't have a time. I didn't have the time to feel my impressions of him. I just wanted so desperately. I, I said, I can't tell you how much I want to be accepted. I know, I know I just burst into tears. 
but you must accept me, you must accept me. And he just sort of read my karma. He said, you have good karma. And uh, after half an hour, he accepted me. And I went to Mount Washington, I lived there. And it was for me a wonderful way of life. I, have a, I had a chance to live with this great man. And they say that a, no man is great in the eyes of his own ballet. This is not true of Yogananda. Those who were closest to him had the deepest appreciation of how great he was. And my book is an attempt to show that that greatness was very multidimensional. He was not somebody who sort of stood up there and pontificated, not at all. He was so natural. He had such a wonderful sense of humor. And uh, he could laugh at so many things. I remember one time I went to the theater with him. There was a, uh, um, actually it was sort of a funny thing. He was a Bengali who was a, a foremost boxer in India. And uh, he was very arrogant and so on. Anyway, he decided he wanted to put on a dance. Well, he may have danced well in the ring, but he didn't dance well on the stage. And uh, he was um, playing the part of a hunter killing a deer. And he would sort of go galumphing around as the hunter and then trying to trip over himself over as a deer. And he decided that the orchestra wasn't playing in time with his dancing. So he went back and he went down to the proscenium and said to the audience, I'm sorry, please forgive me. Uh, please forgive this orchestra, they're no good. But, uh, um, <laughs> and then he started dancing again and every time he came around the orchestra, he'd <laughs> Master and I laughed till the tears <laughs> streamed down our faces. It was so funny. One time I let out a little sort of shriek and the Master said, don't, don't. <laughs> But Master had such a wonderful sense of humor. And yet, you know, the wonderful thing about him too was there was no sense of ego. I never saw him at, at, with even a slight twinge of where do I fit into this? He didn't. It was like when you looked into his eyes, it was like looking into the infinite. He could be so wise and was wise. And yet so naturally wore his wisdom like a comfortable old coat. And uh, living with him, I had many, many opportunities. I have, in the book, in the New Path, I have written, I would say, um, several hundred stories about him. But then I also wrote The Essence of Self-Realization. I also wrote uh, Conversations with Yogananda. And every now and then, the, I remember another story, and uh, I have found that I've lived my life really, I have to say, thinking about those years and thinking about what he said, because there was teaching in every gesture, teacher, teaching in every expression. And sometimes 20 years to 30, 40 years later, I'd remember something, oh, that's what he meant. But I didn't see it right away. For example, one time he told me, he said to me, why does the sun um, not uh, shoot out into space going around the, uh, the earth going around the sun? Why doesn't the earth shoot out into space? And I thought he wanted a lesson in astronomy. And uh, since I studied that, I said, well, it's the centripetal force that pulls it. Centrifugal force, is that a centrifugal, I think? Um, that pulls it, keeps it tied to the sun. And he said, then what keeps the earth from, uh, from falling into the sun? Well, that's its centripetal force that wants to make it keep moving away. And he didn't say anything. And I thought, well, that's nice. He probably wanted a lesson in astronomy. <laughs> Later, I thought back, oh, he had a lesson in that. He was saying that what pulls us, what keeps us to God, what keeps us close to God and rotating around him all our lives, we can't get away from him, is his love. And that love tugging on our hearts. There's something in our hearts that says, I must find happiness. I must find love. I must find that perfection that I'm not finding anywhere else. And then we see something else and we start scrambling after that. 
And it never works. There's one thing that you can say that delusion is infallible in that it never keeps its promises. Well, and then why do we not go back into God? Because of our desires. Because we think, well, just one minute and I'll get this done, then maybe I'll come back. And so we can go on. And I've read books in which people say, well, we may live one or two lives. They sort of admit that possibility. Do you know how many lives we've probably been living? Billions. Billions of lives, not billions of years. In the Bhagavad Gita, it speaks of souls manifesting themselves with a new day of Rama when God manifests this whole universe again and withdraws it. And just think how long it takes before finally man reaches that point where he knows nothing else is going to work. And I reached that point before I met him. He used to, he would teach me in many different ways. He had me come out to, to his desert retreat in 29 Palms. And uh, I worked with him there. It was interesting, I'd been with him. See, I was only 22 when I came to him. And I came in September, on September 12th, in fact. And in October, he was already having me come out there and he was uh, um, having me present while he was dictating teachings and so on. He was giving a lesson on Kriya Yoga. And I had never had the initiation. And you can imagine, I was really lapping it up. And uh, he said, say, Walter, he called me Walter. Say, Walter, you haven't had this initiation. No, sir. I already had heard enough to know what the technique was. And so he said, all right, sit up straight. I'll initiate you right now. And I sat up straight and he gave me the Kriya initiation. But he was giving an initiation at the end of December, two months later. And uh, he said, don't practice it until, the, until you take it formally in, in the initiation. But he had said during his dictation that if you do it quickly, you're not really doing Kriya. So, I thought, well, I can do it quickly. <laughs> and so I practiced it quickly. And uh, we had the long all-day meditation before we were to get the initiation. So I said to Master, um, could I practice Kriya during the meditation? He said, yes, but do it slowly. He knew every single thought I thought. It was absolutely amazing. One time, I was in Beverly Hills, and uh, I was supposed to do a demonstration of the yoga postures, and uh, it was for a Jewish bar mitzvah. I'm not Jewish, but uh, I did the yoga postures, so they asked me to come and do them. And so, afterwards, I got talking to one of these... Uh, um, psychiatrists in Beverly Hills, well, you can pretty well bank on their being thoroughly materialistic. And uh, he was, uh, I tried to convince him by telling him of a few miracles I had observed. And I could see him mentally saying, I have time for this patient Wednesday at 11. <laughs> and Master would often have me um, prepare, I mean, not prepare, but serve lunch to his guests and then have me demonstrate the yoga postures afterwards and so on. Then after they left, I would often sit with him and he would talk. And about two days after that experience in Beverly Hills, he, the yes had left and I was sitting at the table with him and he said, oh, by the way, when you're with atheistic people, don't talk about miracles. I said, you knew? He astounded me. He said, I know every thought you think. And it was true. And here I'm only one disciple. How anyone could have that degree of consciousness where he could know the thoughts of every person. It was staggering to me. Living with him, I had to completely revise my, uh, my understanding of what it meant to be a great human being. There was no greatness in his self-presentation. There was this greatness in the fact that he was so completely humble that there was, there was no he there. The, the, uh, I know one time somebody was talking about uh, his, uh, he'd written something in the Gita interpretations about 
when you attain God, uh, you, you remember that you were all these different things, but when you find him, you, it's as if God had become you and then become God again. That's all it was. And somebody tried to tell him that, well, but you're the one who's saying this. You must be great. He kept saying, why do you say me? He didn't want anybody's attention coming back to himself because he was a window. I remember one time at Mount Washington, I had a, an office. I did office work there, but I was in that little outhouse outside the, the main building, and my room was there, and I could see through the window beautiful um, flowers and plants and so on. And sometimes in my work I would look up and rest my eyes and then um, go back. And uh, one day there was a very heavy rainfall, as you know you can have in Los Angeles, and the window became splattered with mud. And I couldn't enjoy that scene anymore because of all these mud splatters. And I was, if I'd been a woman, a woman I'd have gotten out there right away to clean it, but being a man, it took me a couple of weeks, but <laughs> I did get out there and I cleaned it. And then I remember stepping back from the window and saying, oh, what a beautiful window. And then I laughed. I realized I had thought it was beautiful because I couldn't see it anymore. I could see through it. And that's what Yogananda was. He was, there was no obstruction of ego there. What you are seeing, what you saw through him, was God himself. Man is only a little window onto God. And we are all, if we have any beauty, it's like the, sun, the clouds at sunset. When the sun shines on those clouds, they become beautiful. But those same clouds after the sun sets become gray or even black and no longer have that same beauty. And so as long as we're in tune with God, we shine, but if we forget him, and live a worldly life. People's consciousness, it's amazing what God can do or what man himself does with two eyes, a nose, and a mouth. The variety is incredible. And yet I have known people whom I knew very closely and intimately. When their consciousness changed, I couldn't recognize them. We are only instruments for the consciousness and it's really very interesting to sit and just watch the crowd go by and see so many different states of consciousness, so many desires, so many attachments, so many ambitions, so many hopes, all the things that are there. It's really quite a lesson. But the most important lesson of all is that we must understand that uh, we are not that. We are a part of him. The goal of life and the supreme goal, you know, I'm, I hope to build, to create a new Swami order. I would like to have a periwinkle blue instead of the orange. That's a long story and I'm not going to go into it <laughs> in depth. But I would like to give a positive emphasis to renunciation. It's not just giving up this and giving up that, it's embracing everything. And I would like married people if they have reached the point beyond of not having children and wanting to live uh, temperate lives, that they could be Swamis too. I would like to see this order sweep the world. I would like people to feel whether they live in a spiritual community or not, that they can declare to the world that they have dedicated their lives to God. I bet you that in this room and in this city, why is it that Los Angeles has so much spiritual consciousness. It does. You can feel it when you come here. And yet you see so much goofiness too. <laughs> well, I say people show their goofiness in the things they're interested in. I'm not, I don't show how goofy I am when it comes to mechanics. I'm not interested in mechanics. Wouldn't know how to turn a, how to fix a car at all. All I know about a car is that it's a magical thing. You propitiate it by turning the key. If the motor is pleased, it'll turn over. <laughs> and so I start driving. But this is something, there's, there's a tradition that in ancient times, this was a very spiritual center. And Master said to me that Los Angeles, I consider the Benares, the holy city of America. And it's a blessing really to live here. But you must take that blessing seriously because there is a lot of glitz, 
a lot of outwardness. I know that. I lived here for 10 years. But that search for God, I believe it's more latent here than anywhere else that I've been. And I, yes, I have lived in India for several years. I live there now. I'm trying to create a community there now. But there is something that really warms my heart in this city because I feel that there's so many people who really want to know what it's all about. Those are the people, Jesus Christ said, who is my mother and father and brother and sister, but he who knows, who loves God. And that is what life is all about. Everything else is a waste of time, but every little effort that you make to seek God will be your, path, your raft over the ocean of delusion. Now, I can say this. I mentioned earlier that who needs a guru? But I said also that if you really want God, you do need a guru. I know, I tried so hard to change myself. It was like washing a dirty shirt and a bubble gets over here and you try to push it down and it comes up over here. And so you find a fault that you're trying to work on and you work on that and suddenly another fault comes up. And it's an endless task. But as it says in the Bible, and the Bible is a great scripture, the teachings of Jesus Christ are as great as the greatest scripture in India. But they're not greater. This is the great mistake people make trying to compare. I will never say my guru is better than your guru. It's all God. Everything is God. We must have that generosity to see that whoever loves God is our brother and sister. But when we seek him, then we find that that truth is, it can be expressed in so many different ways as one of the things that really won me in that book, the Short World Bible, was where it, it was a staying of Ramakrishna. Some people like candy, some people like chocolate, some people like sweet meats, some people like ice cream. Everybody likes sweetness. So people like this aspect and that aspect, and God's joy can be defined in so many ways. But what everybody is looking for is that joy. And when you understand that, you have to bow to everybody in the world who is seeking that same joy. There's no room for um, being against this one and against that one. There's no room for sectarianism. There's no room for churchianity. There is one truth and that is God. And he can come to you in the form of a jackal. He can come to you in any form. But one thing, when you know that, it says in the Bible, as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. And what does it mean to receive him? It doesn't mean to say I believe in him. People believe the world was flat. They didn't make it so. You can believe in anything you like about Jesus Christ or Yogananda or Ramakrishna or anything. It doesn't make your understanding any better. You must experience these things. Those, all those who received him, how do you receive? The guru, the purpose of it, there was a, a story my guru told me about a man who was being troubled by a demon. And this demon, um, he read in the Shastras and the scriptures that he could get rid of a demon by, by saying a few mantras into uh, some powder and throwing the powder onto the demon. And so he did it. And when he did it, the demon laughed. He said, before you could even say your mantra into the powder, I myself got into that powder. And my guru, Use this as an illustration to show that the ego with which you try to banish this delusion is already infected with the disease of delusion. You can't get out of it. If your desire is to know God, if your desire is to get out of the ego, if your desire is to find freedom, then you do have to have a guru. I can at least say for myself, and maybe I'm less talented and less intelligent, and less all kinds of things than other people, but I couldn't have gotten anywhere if I'd gone to that jungle and tried to meditate. I didn't know what it was all about. But it wasn't only his teachings. There was something more. 
It was a transfer of magnetism. You know, as a magnet, if you put it next to an unmagnetized piece of steel, that unmagnetized steel will become magnetized. How? Because all of its molecules, which sort of are self, self um, canceling by being directed in haphazard ways, all of them become directed in one way. And you have the power of the universe right within your own body. But because your desires, your tendencies, and so on, samskaras, take you in so many different directions, you hardly have enough strength to get out of bed in the morning sometimes. My guru used to say that in one little gram of flesh, there is enough energy to keep the city of Chicago burning in electricity for one week. We have tremendous power. But until we can learn to direct all that energy and all our aspirations in one way, then it won't be ours. And so in the presence of a guru, I remember one time, just as a little example, how he was talking to some of the monks about holes, that, potholes that needed to be filled in the driveway at Mount Washington. And uh, I wasn't involved in that work. So I had my eyes closed. I used to, it was hard for me because every time he talked to us as a group, he would always look at me and I said, I wish he wouldn't look at me. I just want to meditate and feel his presence. But he always did. But this time he didn't, and I was closing my eyes, and I, I can't tell you the waves of bliss that, that just came over me. Bliss and love were such a power in his presence that sometimes you'd find yourself just weeping. One time when he was editing, I helped him in my small way. I mean, 23, what can you do as an editor? But still, he asked me to, and I know that it was because he saw this in my past, and I, it was a job I had to do. And so I was helping him with editing the Bhagavad Gita. And he was working on the manuscript, and I was sitting at his feet, not doing anything, but just thinking, what a blessing it is to be in his presence. And he didn't say anything, he just kept working. And when it was finished, he asked me to help him to his feet. And then he stood just a moment, looking into my eyes. He said, just the bulge of the ocean. He never saw himself as something to be looked at. He was just a bulge, a little wave on the ocean of God. He always turned our attention back to God. He, living with him, was in itself a fantastic experience. I have met saints in the world. I've met quite a few. I remember one time in Big Sur, California, I was talking to the owner of the Big Sur Inn. This is many years later, so I don't, I don't have to worry about his being upset that I'm quoting him. He's no doubt no longer in the body now. But uh, <clears throat> this was some 50 years ago. But anyway, I told him we'd been talking about spiritual things, and I, I said that I, I think I've met maybe six people in this life who I think knew God. He said, hey, you just met the seventh. <laughs> well, the very way he said it showed me that he hadn't known God. But I have lived with people who really emanated great love and great joy. I stayed many times with Ananda Mohima, many times with other great saints in India, and it was a wonderful memory for me. But I have to say that, and I've already, I'm contradicting myself and I shouldn't, but there was one thing special about Master. I, I am comparing, but I'm not comparing. I know they're all equal, but what endeared me to him was he could be so normal. They were all sort of as if having to fend delusion, keep it off at a distance. He could just mix with everybody. I remember one time he was at this, well it was the same show I told you about that, one where this dancer was doing, it was a strange evening. Anyway there was, <laughs> there was, but you know when that same dancer came down he was all outraged because he was, well I'll tell you the story a little bit further. He'd been chasing this deer, and finally the deer died, and you saw it going through its agonies, and stri sort of striving, struggling all over the floor, and finally died, and you thought, oh, thank God, it's over. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no, we forgot he was the hunter. <laughs> and he went down and picked up this deer and did his victory cakewalk. <laughs> it was so funny. And 
Finally, we noticed that somebody in the orchestra was going like this, and the curtain began to come down. <laughs> All you saw at the end was these feet striding to give the people on the sidelines a, a piece of his, his mind. And afterwards, Master, he was talking and spluttering in outrage, and Master was very loving toward him and said, it's okay, and then he tried to calm him. But there was one man in the group there, uh, not a disciple, just an Indian who had been having a little bit too much, let's say, or perhaps you would say he knew no pain. <laughs> anyway, he was embracing Master like this, like an old drinking buddy, and there was a Bengali disciple there who um, made some deprecating remark about his condition. Master said, don't. He had respect for everybody. There was one, one man, he came into a hotel, and uh, this man was drunk, and he, when he, met, when he saw Yogananda just walking across the lobby, he came up to him, embraced him, he said, hello, Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> Yogananda, with dignity, said hello. And uh, he saw that this man was uh, obviously, again, feeling no pain, and he, he thought he would just give him a little touch of bliss, and he did. And this man reared back and said, hey, well, what are you drinking? <laughs> Master said, I can tell you this, it has a lot of kick in it. <laughs> but he was so natural and so human, and yet so perfectly human, and that was the thing that absolutely amazed me. He didn't need to be off in the, in the woods, he didn't need to have this mask of austerity to keep people somewhat at a distance. He could be anywhere because he was, okay, this is what it says in the, in the Bhagavad Gita. Whenever evil increases and virtue declines, I incarnate myself on this planet as an avatar. An avatar has a very special meaning. It's wrongly understood nowadays. He and his avatar as an actor or something. That's not the right meaning. An avatar means this, that when you have attained freedom from ego, when you understand that everything that you're doing, God does through you, and that is really what the path is all about. That's what I want to emphasize in my monastic order because I've, seen, I've met too many swamis who are very egotistical. The ego is the first thing we've got to work on. We've got to eliminate this thought of being pleased when things go right or when people praise us and displease the people insult us it's all the same it's all just a part of god's dream but when we have achieved that state and attained master said to me once remember you won't be completely free until you have attained nirvikalpa samadhi complete freedom from the ego complete freedom of delusion but then he said then the real work begins. And in fact, one disciple of Ramakrishna said that I used to think that once you attain Nirvikalpa Samadhi, the work is finished. He said, it's only just begun. <laughs> That's no joke. <laughs> then you have to go back over all your lives. You perhaps as a pirate, you as a businessman, you as a famous chef, whatever it might be, and release the karma of each of those lives. Realize that it was God acting through you who did everything. Because God has dreamed this entire universe. We don't exist except a part, as a part of his dream. But because we've somehow defined ourselves by this body, and we carry around with us this burden of self-definition, so we become more and more limited in our bodies. But you're no different from me. You're no different from the people sitting next to you. We're all one. It's like the flames in a burner on a stove. Each flame looks separate, but all are manifestations of that same gas underneath. And so when you've attained that freedom from realizing that you're not that little flame, you're, you're the gas itself, the bliss itself, really not gas, but formless, <laughs> formless, absolute. But then when you have finally released all the for all the karmas of different lives. Master said to me that of the saints in autobiography of a yogi, the on, only ones who were completely free were Babaji, Lahiri Mohashai, 
some you should stay sure. And two of Lahiri Maharaj's disciples, the saint with two bodies, Ram Gopal Mosham Dhan, and uh, uh, Swami Parabhananda, the saint with two bodies, as he's described in Autobiography of a Yogi. He told me he had met one other liberated soul in, um, uh, as a, he was a disciple of Ramana Maharshi, Ram, Sri Rama Yogi. And I got to spend four days with him. It was a very blissful period in my life. But this freedom, all these other great saints, and they were great saints, and in fact they have everything that Master had, any Master can have, but they still had that little burden of past karma. And I said to Master, well, can't they just say when they've, when they've attained that state that they're free? And he said, yes, you can say that, but many of them don't want to because they take this as a, an excuse to come back and help their disciples. So those great saints are not less great for having been Jivan Muktas, not so at all. But that freedom, once you've attained freedom from everything, first of all you're a Jivan Mukta, which is to say that state of freedom while living, freedom from the ego. But once you've attained Param Mukta, Siddha, that perfect state of absolute freedom, you have no karma and you merge into God. Sister Gyanamata, who was Yogananda's most advanced disciple, I remember after she left her body, he said, I saw her merge back into that watchful state. And she didn't have any desire to come back. She'd suffered enough. And most people, there's a story that Ramakrishna told too, about um, three men who left a village. And they went outside this village and they saw a high wall. And they wondered, well, what could be on the other side of that wall? And they figured, well, the three of us, we might be able to get one person up there, and uh, then he can tell us what's over there. So they managed to get one up on a, a stand on a rock, and then somebody else got up on his shoulder, and he was able to get up onto the top of the wall. And he looked down on the other side, and he clapped his hands joyfully and jumped down, and the others waited and waited. <laughs> he never came back. And so, the second one said, well, I promise I'll come back and tell you. So anyway, they, they found a stump and the man st one man stood on that stump and the other one got on his shoulders and was able to climb, pull himself up to the top of the wall. And as he stood on that wall, he said, oh, he clapped his hands gleefully, jumped down on the other side. He never came back. And this third one said, I've just got to know what's there. So he found a trunk and he leaned it against the wall and he was able to clamber up this trunk and finally get on top of the wall. And he saw on the other side the most beautiful garden he could possibly imagine. And his only desire after that hot, dirty, dusty city, village rather, was to jump down and just enjoy. But then he thought of all those villagers back home who didn't know about this garden. Although they could find it easily, they didn't know anything about it. He's never heard of it either. And so he said, let me wait. Let me not enjoy it completely. Let me come back into this world. And he went back to the village and told other people about it. Well, there are most people when they attain that state, they're just, they've suffered for so many incarnations. They've been through so much trouble and pain. I asked my guru one time, have I been your disciple for thousands of years? He said, it's been a long time, that's all I'll say. I said, Do they, does it always take that long? He said, yes. Desires for this and that take them away again and again. But when you've reached the point where you know this is what you want, God will test you. He won't make it easy. This is not a path for sluggards. <laughs> but when you really are serious, when you know that nothing possibly can work for you, and unfortunately, you would like to think that people would seek him for love only, but there's always that little thing, maybe I can find it in fame, maybe I can find it in money, maybe I can find it in this woman, in that woman, in this man, in that man. And it goes on and on and on. I remember him telling Mr. Cuaron, who was the head of our center in Mexico City, I lost touch with you for a few incarnations and now I've found you again, but I'll never lose touch with you again. And every now and then, Koron would say, you remember your promise, Master? And the Master said, no, I'll never lose touch with you again. But 
What a wonderful path. You know, the wonderful thing about it is that when people find God, there isn't anyone in history, in any religion, in even any country, in any continent, anywhere, who has said, what a scam. <laughs> in every other field, people are disappointed, disillusioned. They don't have what they want. Rich people are not happy. Poor people are not happy. Um, uh, well, I could go on and on. Nobody's happy. Nobody has attained what he wants. They always think, just around the next corner, just this little thing and it keeps them going forever. But once you've found that, then some great souls, and this is what Yogananda was, it says in the Bhagavad Gita, whenever vice increase, it, it, it increases and virtue declines, I incarnate myself as an avatar on this planet, and I bring these things back to mankind. I, bring, I punish evil, not evil doers, mind you, but evil, and I bring virtue back onto its seat again, and this was the role of Yogananda in this life. Now, this is another thing that's very interesting, and I'm just going to touch on it here. But uh, Yogananda told us something that I could, I could hardly believe. He said he was William the Conqueror in a past life. And I thought, my God, I was raised in the English system, and in England they think of William the Conqueror as one of history's great villains. And, here I find he's my own guru. I thought there's, I had to do a lot of reshuffling there. And I've made a study of it. And in fact, I asked Catherine Van Houten to, to do research. She's a very good researcher and she's just finished a book. We only have, we have a readers only edition here, but two souls and four lives. It's very interesting. I myself have to say that I think, and this book does a very good case of, sort of proving it, that I was his youngest son, Henry, in that lifetime. And he, too, doesn't get the good end of the uh, stick at all. People think of him as, well, first of all, he was the least known king in England. His only purpose was to finish his father's mission. Secondly, they think of him, you know, when a person doesn't have any personal motives, he doesn't want anything from anybody, people say, well, come on, everybody's got a motive. If you're not going to talk about what yours are, frankly and openly, that can only mean that your motives are dark. And so people who have no wish except to help other people, they often get accused of having deep, dark motives of hurting people, taking from people, getting rich. I was on a TV show, on a radio show many years ago, and uh, here in Los Angeles, in fact, and the, uh, I had put out a record of my songs, and the uh, interview was, saying, well, why did you write these? I said, well, I'd like to raise the money to uh, build a retreat so people come. So you can make a lot of money, huh? <laughs> what are you going to do? I don't make any money at all. I don't take royalties from my books. I just don't care about it. But this is how people are. This is how they see. Anyway, Catherine, why don't you just come up if you can? Where are you? Just, I'd like you to meet her because she's a very good researcher and she wrote this book. And uh, I really think it's a blockbuster. <laughs> because it gives you an understanding. William the Conqueror, although he had to, he had to be strong because was, those were a dark age. I remember Master, he was very impersonal too. He, you'd think that somebody who came to this world just to help other people would be interested in saving them from anything. But he said, those who have left here, I myself drove them away by my willpower. They weren't taking advantage of this way of life. Sounds like a very cold thing, but it wasn't cold. He just knew that they needed more experience, he thought, in terms of thousands of years. I remember him talking to me one time about people who die and everything. He said, God eats people. <laughs> you think a master is going to be pious and everything? <laughs> he wasn't. But he was all the time very firmly anchored in helping people. I remember one thing he never did was force obedience on anyone. 
he would say to somebody who was falling into delusion, try to invite him, try to offer some better outlook. But when it didn't happen, he knew they'd come back. You can't get away from God. One person said to him, Sir, will I ever fall from the spiritual path? Master answered, how could you? Everyone in the world is on the spiritual path. That's what it's all about. That's why we're living. And you may think you're living to become a great movie actor or whatever. None of those things matter at all. But the more you can feel God's bliss in yourself, and I can say this, I've been doing these things now for 61 years, and I can say that the bliss sometimes is so great I can hardly contain it. This is what life is for. And I see other people, I just long to give them that bliss because it's what everybody wants. Let me give you a little example. I don't move very quickly or easily these days. Of a conversation Sorry. Of a conversation that we had a few of the monks with Master out at 29 Palms. To a group of us one day, Master told of an amusing occurrence during his months of dictation on the Bhagavad Gita. Jerry Torgerson had taken a notion to cover the roof of Master's house with concrete. It was an outrageous idea, but Jerry had insisted over Master's objections that such a roof would endure forever. I then told him to finish the job right away, Master continued, but Jerry said, it will be all right, I know what I'm doing. Master was laughing. First he put tar paper down on the roof, then he nailed chicken wire over it. At this point, the roof was a complete sieve. Hundreds of nails were sticking through it. Hurry up, I urged, but Jerry saw no reason to rush things. Well, presently a huge storm came. Pots and pans were put out frantically in every room. Water dripped everywhere. The house was like a shower bath. <laughs> but there were two rooms in which no water fell, my dictation room and my bedroom. Forgive me if I sit down now. I, this old body is the, the sort of a... Well. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. The roof over these two was as much a sieve as over the rest of the house. But Divine Mother didn't want my work to be interrupted. Only at the very end of the storm, one drop fell into a bucket in the dictation room and another one onto my bare stomach in the bedroom as I lay relaxing on the bed. That was Divine Mother's way of having a little fun with me. Jerry, who was present, said, I'm sorry I'm so stubborn, sir. Well, that's all right, Master spoke consolingly. I attract stubborn people. <laughs> he has great love, Master said to me later of Jerry. That is what changes people. Looking at Henry one day, I said, I'm the boy now. Master told us, Henry dug the cesspool near this house. He kept digging, digging all day long without ever stopping to see how far he had gone. By evening, to his surprise, he found he had dug a deep hole. That, Master went on approvingly, is the way to seek God. Continuously digging, digging, without looking to see how far one has come. Then, suddenly one day, he will see, I am there. One weekend, Mrs. Harriet Grove, the leader of the SRF Center in Gardena, California, California, came out uninvited with James Collar to see Master. Not knowing where his retreat was, she found it by pure intuition. Turn left here, she told James, who was driving. Turn right there. Then suddenly, stop. This is it. And so it proved to be. This is the afternoon, Master told her when she arrived, that I usually go out for a ride in the car. But I knew you were coming, so I stayed home. Master, James said that weekend, I have such a great longing for God. 
Why does he take so long in coming? Ah, Master replied with a blissful smile. That is what makes it all the sweeter when he does come. Such is his romance with the devotee. Sir, said Debbie, a boy from Calcutta, anxious for a taste of such longing, give me the grace of devotion. You are saying, give me the money so I can buy what I want, but I say, no. First you have to earn the money. Then I will give it to you so that you can buy what you want. In the evenings, Master exercised by walking slowly around his retreat compound. Generally, he asked me to accompany him. He was so withdrawn from body consciousness on these, those occasions that he sometimes had to lean on my arm for support. He would pause, swaying back and forth as if about to fall. I am in so many bodies, Master remarked to me one day as he returned slowly to body consciousness. It is difficult to remember which body I am supposed to keep moving. Boone visited 29 Palms for a short time. Accompanying Master and me one evening on our walk, he asked many questions concerning spiritual matters. You shouldn't talk to me when I'm in this state, Master said finally. The deepest wisdom he was implying is beyond words. It must be experienced in the silence of inner communion. But when he did speak, his words during those days were filled with a wisdom rarely to be found in books. At such times he would remind me, write my words down. I don't often speak from this level of impersonal wisdom. More and more from this time onward, he began to speak not as a humble devotee of God, but as one whose consciousness was saturated with the ultimate realization, aham brahmasmi, I am spirit. One evening, Boone Master was doing energ energization exercises by the garage with Boone and me. Boone asked him about a certain saint who had appeared to him once in Encinitas. Who was he, Master? I don't know to whom you're referring, Master replied. It was out in the back garden, sir, on the bluff above the ocean. Well, so many come, Master said. I often see them. Some have passed on, others are still on this earth. How wonderful, sir, I exclaimed. Why be surprised, Master replied. Wherever God is, there his saints come. He paused a minute or two while he did a few exercises. Then he added, Yesterday I wanted to know about the life of Sri Ramakrishna. I was meditating on my bed and he materialized right beside me. We sat side by side holding hands for a long time. Did he tell you about his life, I inquired? Well, in the interchange of vibration, I got the whole picture. After Master's passing, the first part of this conversation was published, along with many other sayings I and others had recorded, in a book of his sayings called The Master Said. Laurie Pratt, the editor, changed Master's words here to read, wherever a devotee of God is, there his saints come. The problem with her version was obvious. I too, after all, am a devotee of God, yet I make no claim to have been so pestered. <laughs> Tara was concerned lest readers, Tara was her monastic name, Tara was concerned lest readers fault him for a seeming lack of humility. In fact, I learned in time that his way of speaking to us monks tended to be more impersonal than it was to the nuns. I can assure the reader, however, that while he actually, that what he actually said was, wherever God is, there his saints come. One evening, Master was walking around his compound with Boone and me. He was holding on to Boone's arm for support. After a few minutes, he stopped. Hot, he remarked, was switching from Boone's arm to mine. Boone at this time was going through a period of temptations that, alas, ended up taking him off the path. During this time also, Master gave me much personal advice. Your life is to be one of intense activity, he told me one evening, and meditation. Your work will be lecturing, editing, and writing. Sir, I protested, you yourself have written so much already. How can more writing possibly be needed? How can you say that? My, surpri my question surprised him. 
Much yet remains to be written. Some months later, I addressed him further on this subject. Master, I said, someone has suggested to me that I write a book explaining how I was drawn onto the path. Somewhat like Thomas Merton's seven-story mountain. It might help many people, she says. Would you like me to write it? Not yet, Master replied. As we discussed the idea further, I, was, I understood that he was implying that he did want me to write such a book in time. You have a great work to do, he emphasized again one, e one afternoon. He said that to me many times. We were taking a short walk on his retreat grounds. You must therefore be conscious of how your words and actions affect others. He was trying to get me to combine childlike simplicity with the dignity of one who was centered in the inner self, a difficult combination it seemed to me at the time. Well, this goes on and it's absolutely fascinating and I feel like reading more and more. <laughs> so, hey, this is good stuff. <laughs> But I remember one time out of the desert, he said, everyone except St. Lin, that was the name he had for Rajashi Janakananda, every man has disappointed me. And he turned to me and he said, and you mustn't disappoint me. And I knew that the men hadn't disappointed him spiritually. But there is this difference between men and women. Men's energy is more outward, women is more inward. And he wanted men to spread his teachings, to spread his work. The women disciples couldn't understand my zeal for it, but he pushed me in that direction. And I wanted, even as I came across the country to meet him, I was thinking, this is such a wonderful mission. I would like to spread it through the whole world. I want everybody to know about it. And he pushed me in that direction and I think that I, he understood that I could only do it on my own. And I have done my humble best. But one of the things that he said, I remember it was a garden party in Beverly Hills. And he talked with more power than I have ever heard anybody speak with before. And he said, this day marks the beginning of an era. And my words shall not die. I am sowing my thoughts in the ether and my words shall not die. And he said, he was talking about community, he said, thousands of youths must go north, south, east, west, everywhere to spread this teaching. And I vowed that I would do my best to create such communities. And with God's grace, I have been able to. We're starting the eighth of these communities near Pune in India. And they're building my house now. By the time I get back there at the end of the year, I hope it'll be ready. But. Uh, a place where people can live together. They don't have to be monks or nuns. They can, be, they can have children, they can have families. Most of our people don't have families because they want to live for God. But when you live with people who are kind and supportive, this is what Ananda is. People come from all over the world to us because they feel that in these people there is something they want. I remember a man came to me a few years ago he said, you have wonderful people here. I said, if only if you met one or two such people, you could say they're wonderful people. But when you meet everybody who's like that, you've got to say it's what they're doing that's wonderful. What Yogananda came to do, and he said this again and again in public, he said, you don't know what a great work this is. He wasn't speaking of an organization. He was speaking of a mission. Self-realization has come to change the world. People everywhere must understand that the goal of life is God communion. And he also tried to show in many ways, and I've tried to tune into him to see how every part of life, marriage, child uh, education, business, politics, everything, how it can be not, reg not disregarding its realities. All those things have their own reality but to show how these things direct toward a higher truth. I remember what really began my search this way to see how I could serve him through writing. 
I had read in a book, it was by, it was a magazine article in SPAM, the United States Information Service in New Delhi. About, it was by the director of the philosophy department, the chairman of the philosophy department in MIT in Massachusetts. And he was showing how the findings of modern science have made people think that life has no meaning, there's no purpose to it at all, there's no God, there's, everything is accidental and so on. And I had had these teachings of Master and I said that I can see clearly that every one of these doubts that people have expressed is an obvious answer to it. But I resolved that I would write a book and that was one of the hardest tests of my life because I couldn't just say that's nonsense. I had to get into the camp of the enemy to read it and understand it from his point of view, to see what his reasoning was, and then to show how his own reasoning was fallacious and it really pointed to a higher truth. This book is now called Out of the Labyrinth and Sean, whom you heard earlier this evening, he first came to Ananda, I remember, he had read this book and he had not read this book. He came to me with full of doubts. He, was, he studied philosophy, he'd studied science, and he had so many doubts about whether, whether there's a God, whether there's meaning in life, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I said, read that book. He read it and he came and joined Ananda and he's been with us ever since. These teachings are so deep, but that book was a hard book to read, to write, because I had to get, as I said, I had to go into the camp of the enemy, suspend my own devotional beliefs. And it took me years to write that book but I think it's one of the most important books I've read. Please do read it. It's not easy, but once you've read it, I think your whole, your horizon will be much, much broader. So, Out of the Labyrinth, and I wrote another book on that same subject, Hope for a Better World, in which I analyzed all the big guns, you might say, in Western philosophy, and showed how in terms of their own thinking, what they can, their conclusions were not adequate and everything pointed to God. But finally, what I pointed out was that the answer to the world's problems today, and Master said this, will, this idea will spread like wildfire through the world. People will suddenly see that big cities living is not the answer. Get land. We're coming to a very great depression right now. The Fed keeps trying to say that we're almost out of it. I don't believe it for a moment. Master said that the dollar will not be worth the paper it's printed on. I say this to you with great earnestness. If you can't join Ananda, if you can't start an Ananda community, take a few friends, go out and buy land in the country, grow your own food, learn to live simply, because everything that you see today here, freeways and everything, it'll all be gone. It's not going to last. We are in a new age right now, an age of energy, and the old age of fixed thinking, fixed everything, thinking that this world is solid, that's, that's passe now, it's a new time. Please listen to me, because I'm not spending much time talking about it, but I mean it very, de very deeply and very sincerely. Buy land in the country, buy land where you can grow your own food, live simply, live with a few others, and we are now, we have finished our 40th anniversary of Ananda, and I'm here to say it works. And it's so wonderful to see that everybody around you is supportive of you. If somebody uh, needs help, they're all there to help them. If somebody's in the hospital, they're all there to help them with money, with funds, with whatever. It's the best insurance, if you want to look at it from a practical plan standpoint, the best insurance you can have. The insurance companies will be going broke, but this, when you have a group of people standing together, they're the best insurance possible. Well, I can't go on. I'd keep you here all night if I were to pursue my enthusiasm that way. But remember, and I'd like to finish by reading the last chapter of this book. If I can get to it. The final goal of life isn't communities, it isn't anything, except, as I read here, 
Paramahansa Yogananda taught us above all that the true goal of life is union with God. Devotion, self-offering, self-surrender, oneness in bliss and divine love. These are the enti entire purpose of life. I remember one day when Master played a recording for a small group of us by a famous singer of Bengal, Minil Kanti Ghosh. It was a devotional song, Pashan Hoy, and I'll read you the English of it. How long will you remain, mother? A stone image before my gaze. Set fire ablaze in your eyes and come to me dancing all over creation. O oh, mother divine energy fills the universe with your flowing hair. Garland, but garlanded by thoughts in all minds. Dancing, dancing, O oh, mother, free me this day, this very moment from delusions bonds. Countless lives have I lived apart from you. At last now, bring peace into my body temple. I don't remember all the words and I'm not conversant enough in Bengali to understand many of them. But I remember Master telling us afterwards as I was listening, I too was dancing over all creation. Man's relationship with God is intimate and infinitely dear. What I've hoped above all in writing this book has been to convince you, dear reader, to live more deeply for God, to love him so completely that you become wholly absorbed in him. God hears our every prayer. Of all aspects of the divine, that of mother is the sweetest. As my guru once said, mother is closer than the father. I too prefer to pray to God as my divine mother. And I can testify to the truth of what my guru told us. When you pray to her, she will answer. How often have even my trivial requests been answered, like the so-called, well, this is something I didn't, I mentioned earlier and I have to quote it, so I won't go it. One needn't be formal in prayer. Indeed, God should be approached as one's own dearest friend and beloved. Many years ago, another example, I felt that Divine Mother wanted me to return to India. I had been absent from there for 10 years, but now I had enough money saved to go back and stay there for about two months. Shortly before my scheduled departure, I was driving my car into San Francisco when the engine threw a rod. I realized I'd have to trade in this car for a newer one. This need, however, placed me in a dilemma. The money for my trip was all the wealth I had. Should I trade in my car and buy a new one? Or should I keep my money for the trip Divine Mother wanted me to take? I've always tried to reconcile faith with common sense. Ananda Village is located in the mountains, far from urban, urban conveniences. A car is, for me, a virtual necessity. I wouldn't be able to stay long in India. Without a vehicle, I'd be virtually stranded upon my return. What should I do? I asked Divine Mother for guidance. I knew of no place in which to sit quietly and tune in. All I could think of was to have a quiet lunch with a few friends in a downtown restaurant. No guidance came. Finally, I said, Divine Mother, you haven't answered me. Perhaps I haven't been silent enough to hear you. Common sense tells me, however, that I must have a car when I return from India. I see no reasonable choice, therefore, but to buy one. If you still want me to take this journey, you will have to reimburse me. <laughs> I paid $1,100 for a good second-hand car. This money, along with 700 I received for my crippled vehicle, covered the cost. I left the car dealership on a Friday evening. The next Monday morning at home, I re received a letter from someone unknown to me. Enclosed was a check made out to me personally for $1,000. The letter stated, please use this money as Divine Mother wants you to. Now please ask yourself, how many people in America pray to God as their Divine Mother? Hardly any. 
Every time I recall this episode, my eyes fill with tears. Many, many times in my life have I found Divine Mother's loving assistance fulfilling my needs, answering my questions. In living for God, I have found the thrill of an unceasing divine romance. Let me end this book by writing out, first in Bengali, then in English, a devotional song. Thoughts from it found expression in two of my guru's favorite chants. Amar shadna mitilo, ashana purilo, shakuli furae jai ma. Amar shadna mitilo, jono mershan, gata ki goma tore, kule tule nite ae ma. it's so beautiful. E priti bi bhalo bashite jane na jeta ache shudhu bhalo basha bashi shita jete pran shai ma shok uri furai jai ma Amara shadna mitilo, boro da gapeye, basho na te jichi, boro jala shoye, kemo na gugechi, boro da gapeye, basho na te jichi, boro jala shoye, kemo na gugechi, one kandechi, Candite parina, bufette benge. Bufette benge, jaya ma, ma. Shokkuli furae, agae ma. Amar shadana, miti lo. My desires have not yet been fulfilled. My hopes not yet realized. Oh, Mother, my earthly dreams have all fled away. Once more I call out from the pain of my heart, Mother, take me on your lap. Oh, Mother, my earthly dreams have all fled away. In this world, mother, who is there that truly loves? In this world, they do not know how to love. There where true love is, there alone would my heart dwell forever. Oh, mother, my earthly dreams have all fled away. Long, long have I called you, dearest one. How much longer can I keep on calling? For love of you, my heart is breaking. Oh, mother, my earthly dreams have all fled away, yet my hopes, alas, have not yet been fulfilled. What a beautiful song. As so ends my story, as Sister Gyanamo Mata would often say, God alone, God alone. And I would like to end this somewhat scattered talk <laughs> with a song of masters, a poem which I put to music. And would somebody bring the tambura here and I'll sing it. God, God, God. And you can join me in the refrain. Where is Claire? I trust something's going to happen here. <laughs>
I feel terribly embarrassed, but I just can't help it. <clears throat> from the depth, from the depths of slumber as I ascend, the spiral stairway of wakefulness. I will whisper, whisper, God, God, God. Thou art the food, and when I break my fast of nightly separation from thee, I will Taste thee and mentally say, God, God, God. No matter where I go, the spotlight of my mind will ever keep turning on thee. And in the battle din of activity, my silent war cry will be God, God, God. When boisterous storms of trials shriek, and when worries howl at me, I will drown their noises loudly chanting God, God, God. When my mind weaves dreams, dreams, with threads of memories, on that magic cloth will I emboss God, God, God. Every night in time of deepest sleep, when my peace dreams and calls joy, joy, my joy comes singing evermore. God, God, God. In waking, eating, working, dreaming, sleeping, serving, meditating, chanting, divinely loving, my soul will constantly hum unheard by any God, God, God. God bless you all, friends.